talking about chords and unraveling the mystery of it. We're going to talk about the theoretical aspect of it, and I want you to go slow, and we'll slow all of this stuff down and show this to you. But first of all, let me open by telling you why chords are important. See, music does exist in chords. It's not so much a scalar thing. Again, scales will have their place of being able to find the notes. There's some type of music like classical that will really depend very much on scales. But uh, if you understand the chord, you're able to get to, uh, to play the, one thing, it gives you the ability to play the correct notes that would fit the chord. It doesn't make you an instantly great bass player, but it does give you the material to understand and to be able to relate to your fellow musicians. And I remember doing gigs when I was using this, what I'm going to show you, and uh, we were rehearsing. I forgot uh, who it was for or, or the situation. But we were working on a chart, and I mentioned to the piano player, and I said, man, I think that's a four sharp half diminish. And he kind of looked at me real funny and thinking, man, what's a bass player talking about chords for? And it really is not that hard. And uh, I'm going to show you some, I'm not going to call them shortcuts, but I'm going to show you functionally how music works. And I want you to trust this system. If you remember uh, what I said at the inception of this series, is repetition is the mother of skill. And this is what's going to be very, very important. So we're going to go slow on this. Now, I did mention to you in the last segment that we played a major scale and we're building a chord or a triad. A triad is a three note grouping sounded simultaneously to give us a chord. For someone that's self-taught, and I came up self-taught, I mean literally, I got a situation where the guitar player said, here, put your finger here. And he, you know, he played like a uh, like a, an, an A chord, and I was thinking, wow, that's, that's really cool. But I wondered what notes would fit in that, and uh, later on I found out basically how this works. So you're going to be way ahead of the block, not just knowing what the chords are. See, that's another thing, um, and we'll get into that in, in other segments, of what the function of the chord is, and it's not that hard. It's not just good enough to know what notes are in a chord, but how that chord relates, and I'll show you all that stuff and uh, we'll try to clear up a lot of misconceptions and get you going on a good musical foundation. So, G major scale that we all know and love, and we'll use G as our model. This will transfer over to other keys. We'll get into that later on. And with the G major scale, again, we're building a chord off of the one, building a chord off two, three, etc., and so forth. Now, Here's the idea. We're dispensing once more with the note names and we're calling them by numbers, which will help point the way of how a chord functions. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Quick review. If you take every other, check it out, every other note and play it, in other words, play one, skip the two, play three, skip the four, play five, there's your major triad that we talked about in the last segment. Now how you form these chords, and this is why this term, and this, you can look this up in music encyclopedias, the diatonic chords, which I've been told means of the scale. And this will unlock a lot of things, not only with the fretboard, but harmonically with you, and you'll be able to understand chords. It's not complicated. Don't worry about seeing things like a ninth chord in that Buffalo Speaker. I'll show you a real interesting thing called the Rule of Seven. Uh, in a few minutes that will help clear that up right away uh, and at least point you in the right direction. So to get our first chord built off of one, it's a one major. Now why wouldn't it be a one minor? Well you see the B flat that I played doesn't exist in the major scale. In other words, no, it would exist in a minor scale. We're talking about a G major scale. So we're using one, three, five. That gives us the major, the one major chord. Two, again, just skip every other uh, number. Two, three, four, five, six. So if I'm using scale degrees two, four, and six, that gives us a two minor chord. One major, two minor. Using that same theoretical uh, situation, three, five, seven, which gives us the three minor chord. Now, the rule is, is that as we are assembling this, these chords, we can only use the notes of the G major scale. 
check it out. One major or the one chord. Anytime you uh, pronounce a chord or write it down one, a naked number as I call it, uh, that will always denote major. So one major, one, using scale degrees one, three, five, two minor, scale degrees two, four, six, three minor, three, five, seven, four major, four, six, eight, five chord, five, seven, we're gonna go out of the octave and call that a nine. Oh my gosh, now how are we gonna be able to interpret that? Use something called the rule of seven. I wish I could remember where I learned this from. I didn't invent this. I think it might have been a, a jazz text or something. I thought it was so cool and I always remembered that. Rule of seven. Did I call this the ninth? Check it out. Here's a major scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Go up a full step. And that A I made available here so I wouldn't have to shift. That's just as valid. There's no right or wrong. It's knowing what the difference is. Again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Subtract seven from nine, what do you get? Two. So A, the octave, is the ninth of the chord. Check it out, if you're looking at a chord symbol where people are saying, uh, that's the eleventh of the G, and it's, oh, that's real intimidating. Subtract seven from eleven, what do you get? Four. Count up scale degrees. One, two, three, four. Raise it an octave. There's your 11th. 13th, well, 7 from 13 is 6. There it is. You can get, in fact, I'll show you this on functional harmony. It's real interesting. If you're playing uh, like a, a, an extended chord, you superimpose one chord against another, and that will give you uh, the upper functions of a chord. We'll get into that fully. And I don't want to confuse you right now, but use the rule of seven. If, you, if, if somebody's trying to really impress you and say, well, uh, that's an A9 chord. Okay, we're in A. Think of the A major scale. Subtract seven from nine. What's that, two? There's a first note of the A major scale. It's a B. There's a nine. Simple as that. So, sorry, I wish I could make that more complicated to you, but the rule of seven, it's really hip and we'll talk about how we'll be able to use it later on. But you can see what we've done is build a triad off of each degree of the major scale. That's really important, especially, man, um, I, we'll have guests come into the studio, and uh, there was a time, I don't do that currently, that uh, I was mentoring young men in my church, and some of these men, as you might imagine, um, were uh, bass players. Uh, not all of them, but most of them were, or musicians. And they were really curious about what it was like to uh, play a session. And they were amazed, they really were, and I can understand that now, of why we could, uh, in a three hour period, get five songs we've never heard before. We walk in and they'll give us a, a, a chart with numbers on them, and uh, we've never heard that song before, and we'll have five completed tracks. And that's done day in and day out. Well, there's a system with that. Uh, what people, here's the thing, I can show you the technique here of how this works, and this will work in Nigeria, Liberia, uh, Uzbekistan, it'll work in bluegrass, and it's, this is the common DNA of music, if you will. The thing it won't give you, and this, I would really urge you as, as, a, uh, as a disciple of the bass, um, uh, of finding a way to express yourself, is listen as much as possible to widely as possible to, to music, any type of music. A musician should not have prejudiced ears. Now what I mean by that is, is dig in and listen to something that you might not think you enjoy. Listen to Stravinsky. Uh, if you don't know who that is, check it out. He's not a bluegrass guy. Or um, if you are a dedicated rock and roller, check out Ralph Stanley. If you're a bluegrass aficionado, uh, check out Dexter Gordon. Uh, but listen, it's really important. You'll find your finest musicians are not defined by what you would see in a record store. You go over here, here's this type of music, here's this type of music. And don't be like this. But this is, will supply that common DNA and it'll work on all types of Western music. I can't help you out with the, with the quarter tone scale of Chinese music. That's beyond the scope of what we're doing here. When you're playing these things in time with these long notes, I want you to verbalize the chord. In other words, you'll have to run this up and down a few times because you're putting several elements together. Uh, Again, the metronome, we're pulling it from the air, we're filming the continuum, the continuum of the groove. Four, one, 
two, three, four. One major, two minor, three minor, four major, five major, six minor, seven diminished, eight. It's a good way to start to uh, and I actually will work on forms of this in pretty much exactly what I showed you. Um, it is a listening habit. How well you play determines on how well you listen. And it, for a bass player to have big ears is, is champion. That's the, that's the right thing to do. Because what are you doing here? Man, this is a lot of stuff right here. You're playing in continuity. You're the one that's, that is laying down the one. Nobody's doing that but you. And with all due respect to drum machines, which are absolutely a very creative medium, see there's two types of playing and they do join together. But you have to have this foundation to go to do your own thing, whether you wanted to be the best bass soloist in the world, whether you wanted to play in an orchestra, whether you wanted to play in a bluegrass band, is that continuity of groove. By practicing with the metronome on two and four, you're forced to, again, play the one. By using this, what I've just shown you, of play, playing, playing these diatonic chords, uh, you're outlining the chord, and you get a little bit of music happening. You know, if uh, four, one, two, three, four, four chord, three minor, two minor, five. Six minor, four major, three minor to a five. Incredible little music with that. Uh, when you practice this and go with it slow and use the discipline of metronome, you'll find yourself listening to tunes on the radio. And this is a very, very valuable skill to have. You'll start listening to tunes and say, man, he's playing a two minor there. That's a lot better than just saying, well, I think he's just playing this note here. That's not good enough in the professional world, and that's what we're talking about, where you want these basic skills to come in. So if you practice these diatonic triads and take them to heart and practice them very slowly, you'll start seeing results. Now, we'll expand on this, but it's very important to, to begin using this as we have laid out. So we'll see you in the next segment, and um, if you have any comments, again, you can contact me through Base Frontiers magazine. This is Steve Bryant signing off. Thanks.